we tried to work out the size of the hole in the bulkhead. The peaks at A, B, and C are the loud banks. The three yellow lines are the decompression warning signals. The signals are activated when the cabin pressure goes down to about seven-tenths of normal. The warning signal began to sound one and a half seconds after the first bang. In a jumbo jet, the pressurized section including the cabin has a capacity of 1,820 cubic yards. When in flight, the air in the cabin is roughly equivalent to that at sea level. This air pressure dropped to seven-tenths of normal. We should be able to work out from this the size of the hole in the bulkhead. The vertical axis shows the air pressure in the cabin and the horizontal axis the lapse of time in seconds. When a hole appears in the bulkhead, the air in the cabin gushes out and the cabin pressure drops. The air becomes more decompressed in proportion to the size of the hole. For instance, the speed of decompression when a 3.58 square yard hole is made, or 3 square meters, would be slower than with a 5.98 square yard hole, or 5 square meters. The horizontal flashing yellow line shows the air pressure at seven-tenths of normal. When the air pressure in the cabin drops to this level, a warning signal sounds. The dark red vertical line indicates 1.5 seconds, the time between the first loud bang and the warning signal. From the bright red curved line passing through the intersection of the yellow and dark red lines, we found that the size of the hole was 1.67 square yards or 1.4 square meters. A large volume of air gushed out into the rear of the fuselage through the hole. Now, let's look in detail at the rear of the plane behind the bulkhead. On jumbo jets, the tail fin is 32 feet high, comparable to a three-story building. Was this giant tail fin constructed so as to be strong enough to withstand the great pressure of air that gushed out of the cabin through the bulkhead? This is the aft pressure bulkhead seen from behind. In this area, there's less than four square yards. The four hydraulic lines which control the rudders and elevators pass below the bulkhead into the area at the back of it, extending right through to the horizontal stabilizer. and the tail fin. There is a fin access hole in the top of this small area. It's for inspecting the tail fin. Inside the tail fin, it's rather like a box with many horizontal supports resembling shelves. When it has to withstand pressure, how much can it take? It was found that a tail fin of a jumbo jet breaks when it is subject to a pressure of 2.8 tons per square yard, only less than half the pressure the bulkhead has to withstand. Inside the tail fin, the box-like area has 20 horizontal supports at intervals of about 24 inches. We noted the way these horizontal supports were fixed to the outer skin of the tail fin. They're not riveted directly to the outer skin, but to Z-shaped armatures, which are riveted to the outer skin. Armatures are riveted to the outer skin of the tail fin. And horizontal supports are riveted to these armatures, not directly to the outer skin. You can see there's a gap between the outer skin and the armatures. This method was adopted for the first time when it was used for jumbo jets. An engineer who was once responsible for design at Boeing said it was economical since it simplified the manufacturing process.
In pre-jumbo jet days, the horizontal supports were riveted to both the armatures and the outer skin. The Japanese Aircraft Accident Investigation Commission is studying this problem, where indirect riveting on the left may affect the strength of the tail fin. When the tail fin of Flight 123 broke, what exactly happened? The four hydraulic lines were channeled together and ran along in a very confined space inside the tail fin. If the tail fin were to break, the fail-safe hydraulic system of four lines would be severed at one stroke and the jumbo jet would become uncontrollable. Since the accident, Japan Airlines has carried out intensive maintenance on its 747s, stripping them down extensively. A jumbo jet consists of more than 200,000 to 300,000 different kinds of parts. It takes three weeks to do major maintenance on one jumbo jet on a three-shift system right around the clock. Many fail-safe precautionary measures had been taken throughout the fuselage. The aft pressure bulkhead was constructed so that a crack or rupture would not spread beyond a small confined section. But the rupture did spread and a large hole developed. Had the safety measures been devised to ensure safety throughout the fuselage, even in the case of a large hole developing in the aft pressure bulkhead? Wasn't there a double and triple fail-safe system to prevent such an occurrence in the bulkhead? What was Boeing's fail-safe philosophy for the rear section of the 747? We tried to find out. The headquarters of the Boeing company where its jumbo jets are made is in Seattle, in the state of Washington, USA. On the outskirts of this city is the airplane construction complex. And there's even an airport for exclusive use by its jumbo jets. When we asked permission to videotape interviews at Boeing, the company said it was not willing to make any statements at that stage. But after repeated requests from NHK, Boeing sent us a videotape which contained a reply to our questionnaire, which included a query about fail-safe in the rear part of a jumbo jet's fuselage. The pressure bulkhead was designed so that skin damage growth will be restricted by crack-stopping elements. The 747's horizontal and vertical stabilizer are fail-safe through an inspection program which has a high probability of damage detection. Finally, control cables and hydraulic lines are routed in separate locations inside the fuselage to the rear of the aircraft. As a result of the investigation of the JAL accident, several design reviews were initiated to determine if any changes are required to further protect the airplane from unforeseen events. The reviews include structure, hydraulic, and control systems. Should modifications be deemed necessary, they will be incorporated into production and be considered for retrofit into the existing fleet. For example, in the structure behind the pressure bulkhead, we will install a plug door to prevent a ruptured bulkhead from pressurizing the vertical fin. Parts are now available for that installation. When Mr. Sutter spoke about fail-safe for the rear section of the fuselage to prevent a large rupture in the aft pressure bulkhead, he didn't give a very clear answer, choosing his words very cautiously. We asked a representative of the Federal Aviation Administration about the general safety standards that had been laid down in the past concerning the 747's aft pressure bulkhead. What would happen if the rear pressure bulkhead of those aircrafts 
did fail. I couldn't say for sure what would happen on those. Uh, to my knowledge, there has never been an analysis or a test uh, run to determine the effects of a failure that large. Why, why not? Well, the fail-safe design philosophy is intended to detect um, smaller failures much before it ever get to that stage, whether it be a frame, stringer, web, uh, and it would be, in the case of a pressure bulkhead, uh, a smaller um, crack or failure uh, could be detected through either a loss of pressure or inability to pressurize properly or through an inspection program. We expect to detect those kind of failures much before they become a full pressure bulkhead failure. What if the whole thing blew? Well, that's, uh, I'd say, probably outside of the consideration. We, we hope that won't occur. <laughs> So it's obvious, no one had ever thought the F-pressure bulkhead in a 747 could rupture. But it did, leading to the crash of JAL-123. The accident has proved there was a blind spot in failsafe in the confined area behind the F-pressure bulkhead. Present in the world, there are 605 Boeing 747 jumbo jets. Did the flight 123 jet meet with an accident because of defects in that particular plane? Or does it raise problems common to all jumbo jets? On November 26, a telex was sent by Boeing to the Civil Aviation Bureau of the Japanese Ministry of Transport. The telex included the line, a production change provides for a cover over the fin access hole. This modification was stipulated to prevent the tail fin from having to withstand extreme pressure in the event of a massive rupture of the bulkhead. On December 6, the National Transportation Safety Board issued five safety recommendations to apply to all jumbo jets. Design modification for the tail fin of a jumbo jet. A change in the design of the hydraulic system behind the aft pressure bulkhead. A re-evaluation of fail safe for the aft pressure bulkhead and other recommendations. All of these cast considerable doubt about safety in the past in the rear of a jumbo jet. is a simulation of the flight of the jet just before its crash.
Oh, Tokyo, Japan Air 123, request from immediate uh, travel. The request return back to Haneda. Roger, approved, and you request it. Japan Air 123, confirm your declared emergency. That's right. Uh, that's affirmative. But now I'm controlled. Several passengers wrote last messages to their loved ones. One passenger wrote, My darling wife, life with you has been just wonderful. Children grow up to be people I'd be proud of. I never dreamt that the dinner we all had last night would be our last one together. Five hundred and twenty lives ended in an instant. The Aircraft Accident Investigation Commission is still trying to find out what exactly went wrong. We may never go. And then for the rest of our lives, we feel we've shirked and lived in vain. We must go now. The year is 1936. Alexander Corder's epic feature film, Things to Come, envisaged a future filled with benign and useful machines. Simple to operate, powered by rotors, they would whisk men vertically from the center of cities to fly above the clouds at the speed of a jet. But this was a dream. The first practical helicopter would not fly until later the same year, although a similar machine had already caught the public's imagination. Called an autogyro, it flew like a plane, except that its rotor windmilled as it flew through the air. It could not take off vertically because its rotors were not powered, but at least it could land like the one in the dream. How do you like flying one of these planes? Oh, it's a lot of fun. You have more fun flying this than any other type of ship. You can sit down anywhere and get gas. You don't have to worry about running out. Well, that makes it nice. Yeah, it's fine. These novel machines provoked ideas of replacing cars and flying to work from suburban front gardens. Thirty years later, the dream machine was commuting not to downtown New York, but to the rice paddies of South Vietnam. in a Southeast Asian war that the helicopter came of age. Once conscripted, the machine lost its novelty, the dream faded, and the helicopter became the chopper.
I asked to make a circle of uh, 30 feet diameter, and I put the plane in the middle. Nazi test pilot, the late Hannah Reich. Professor Focke used an, an open fuselage of an already existing aerobatic plane. I could look to see the wheel. Now, when giving gasoline, I saw when the stick wasn't just in the middle, the wheel went forward. And when, when I went the stick a little bit backwards, the wheel went backwards. So when I found now the wheel is standing, I, ga I gave gasoline, and with the gasoline, it went up. I went down again. Within three minutes, I had it. The Fokker Archelis 61 was the world's first really practical helicopter. The two rotors turned in opposite directions for stability. But the all-important lift was controlled by altering the engine speed, a clumsy and sluggish solution. It first flew in 1936, and by 1938, the Nazis were displaying their machine to the world in the Deutschlandhalle, Berlin. Six years earlier, in Belgium, Nicolas Flory had managed a powered takeoff with an unwieldy flying bedstead that demonstrated the principle of vertical lift rather than any practical use. What the bedstead is going to do in the air is not at first apparent but perhaps that is not important until the principle is proved. The real progress was in autogyros. As early as 1933, the brilliant Spanish engineer, Thierva, had shown that if the unpowered rotor was tiltable, it could improve the control of his craft. All the controls are operated by this stick. He could even land safely without the engine running. The Austrian autogyro expert Raoul Hafner developed a variable pitch mechanism which could increase or decrease the lift of the unpowered planes. So by the outbreak of the Second World War, the technology existed, albeit on separate machines, for the development of the first true helicopters. It was in America that the Russian émigré Igor Sikorsky made his first tentative hops into the air. Even as a boy in Kiev, vertical flight had fascinated him. And now, with money made from building seaplanes, he was beginning to crack the problems of instability associated with these machines. Whereas Thierva found that tipping the rotor backwards improved vertical descent, Sikorsky realized he would need to tip the rotor forward to encourage forward flight. But tiltable rotors proved difficult to control. After crashing, he changed the design and added two tail rotors on a T-shaped boom at the back, which he hoped would lift the tail and induce forward flight. Later, the same machine flew, although the controls still seem rather insensitive. flights were recorded on film, but progress was slow and constantly marred by minor accidents.
the winter of 1940, Sikorsky's design was beginning to show promise, and it looked as though helicopters with two rotors on a tail-lifting boom might become the standard American design. His helicopters were already able to perform tricks no other aircraft could manage. On May the 6th, 1941, he broke the world's hovering record previously held by the German Fokker Achgelis. By June, Sikorsky had replaced the twin tail-lifting rotors with one, achieving more responsive forward flight. At the same time, in Germany, Anton Flettner produced a helicopter with contra-rotating intermeshed blades. He also added controls which tilted these rotors forward, enabling him to achieve a speed of 89 miles an hour. The machine was called the Hummingbird, and its use as a military gimmick was not lost on the German Navy. America, Sikorsky had managed to achieve forward flight in the same way, and so dropped the uplifting tail rotors. All this time, a young mathematician called Arthur Young was working on remote-controlled models, investigating instability and the tendency of a helicopter fuselage to spin in the opposite direction.